So uh, let me remind you uh, of the, the, the main things we uh, uh, talked about uh, this morning. We, we had a, a germ of a normal surface singularity. We had its uh, sigma, its link. We had a uh, resolution, pi v twiddle e into v comma e. We had a resolution graph gamma that, from which we could recover the full topology of the link sigma. And we uh, introduced an analytic invariant called the geometric genus of a V. That the, the, and this was analytic. That is to say that uh, it could not be determined solely from the topology. Um, uh, in addition, we mentioned a bunch of examples of uh, singularities that would be important for us so isolated complete intersection singularities. We talked a lot about, uh, we mentioned uh, the important cyclic quotient singularities and um, uh, cones, uh, uh, the cone of C comma L and more generally uh, quasi-homogeneous singularities. So these were singularities that admitted a C star action uh, or uh, if you like, they were defined by weighted homogeneous polynomials, and these were uh, important class of special singularities. And finally, uh, we mentioned uh, rational singularities. And we didn't say uh, too much about them except the definition, oh, it was that the geometric genus is zero, and the, the, while this condition appears to be analytic, it in fact is topologically recoverable um, from the graph gamma. So there's one more property of uh, singularities that the singularities might have that I want to mention and that's the Gorenstein property. So let's make a definition. Um, v comma zero is Gorenstein. If uh, there exists uh, omega, a, a nowhere zero, nowhere zero holomorphic or algebraic two form um, on, um, on V minus zero. So V minus zero is of course a non-singular and uh, as we know uh, forms are very important in geometry and if you have one uh, basic form that's nowhere zero on that, that means the module of all two forms on V minus zero is, uh, uh, is a free module generated by uh, all multiples of this form. So uh, I, uh, the most important example of a Gorenstein singularity is a hypersurface singularity. So example, hypersurface, f equals zero. So what's the form? What's omega? Well, you should write down, I'll put this in quotation marks uh, because it doesn't look like it's a real form dx wedge dy wedge dz divided by df. So that's a, a, a hint for what you really mean, which is on the one hand dx wedge dy over the partial of f with respect to z, um, which is equal to plus or minus dx wedge dz over fy and similarly, the, the other way. Okay, so, um, so what's df? Well, of course, you can make sense of this by multiplying through. So remember, so df is, of course, um, uh, fx dx plus uh, fy dy plus fz dz. So if you do a little algebra, you can figure out why this means that and it means this with a plus or minus sign, I don't remember which. And this makes sense. This is certainly a two form as long as f sub z isn't zero. And this is a two form as long as f sub y is different from zero. But, and similarly for this one, but you have an isolated singularity. So at any point on, off the origin, one of the partials is non-zero. Hence, you have a holomorphic form. And it's, uh, it's patently uh, uh, nowhere zero. So the, the uh, basic case 
of a Gorenstein singularity is a, is a hypersurface. Um, so, in general, um, we'll be talking about Gorenstein singularities. The name I think I mentioned before is probably due to Serre. It was sort of a joke. Uh, I thought it was due to Hyman Bass, but he said it was Serre's idea. It had to do with a kind of duality that comes about. As you know, uh, various duality theorems in algebraic geometry, like Serre duality, have to do with the canonical bundle, with the canonical line bundle. So, uh, if you like, um, this it means that the uh, canonical line bundle of V minus zero is uh, is free. It's a free module, and uh, there, there's a there's a generator. Um, one thing, uh, so we'll be interested in talking about other uh, Gorenstein singularities, um, but uh, some other examples. Um, an isolated complete intersection singularity is also uh, Gorenstein. You can write down a slightly fancier version of what I uh, wrote before. You just take uh, dx1 wedge dxn and then divide by d of the defining equations. So dx1 through dx wedge up to dxn divided by df1 wedge dfn minus 2 and make sense of that. And that, that'll, be your, um, that'll be your nowhere zero form. Um, now, your form that's holomorphic on V minus zero is uh, omega is holomorphic on um, the resolution off the exceptional curve. But now this is smooth. V twiddles is smooth. And E is this, uh, this these normal crossings of divisors. So omega extends meromorphically to V twiddle. So omega extends um, meromorphically to V twiddle, but it'll, it'll acquire poles over E. So it acquires um, the polar divisor uh, summation, I don't know, uh, Ni, Ei. Okay, so that's a general fact on a smooth surface. If you have a, a nice holomorphic form off a curve, it can extend. If it's algebraic, it'll extend, but with possibly with some uh, pole. I could extend with a zero, but we'll just leave things as is. So uh, what this means is that the canonical bundle uh, of V twiddle is this is just the line bundle corresponding to this divisor. To this, to this polar polar divisor. So, uh, this is what you get in the um, in the Gorenstein case. Uh, and uh, how do you figure out what these uh, ni's are? Well, I already mentioned that you just use the adjunction formula. To, so you can solve solve for ni from uh, gamma from the graph because. Uh, if this is what k is, remember k dot ei plus ei dot ei equals 2gi minus 2. So given a graph, if it's Gorenstein, um, you can figure out uh, what this divisor is. Uh, you just uh, have to figure out the, the ni's. You have r equations and r unknowns. and this matrix is negative definite, so you can uniquely solve for the ni's. So uh, one point I should make is that, that if you solve the system of equations on any graph, you can find ni's, but they might just be rational numbers. So this requires, this is a, a numerical condition on gamma, right? Otherwise, in general, um, the ni's are just rational numbers. To solve these equations for all uh, for all i. Um, so I should mention uh, something special that happens for the rational double points. Um, for uh, the minimal good resolution of a rational double point. So that's the thing with, you know, like the Dinkin diagram. 
Uh, omega extends actually extends um, holomorphically with no zeros. No zeros. So that's the exact case that canonical bundle is trivial. So that's, that's a, the unique case. So in general, in every other case, the canonical bundle is going to extend and that's going to have poles. If you look at the minimal resolution, uh, it, w- it, won't, it won't have any, any zeros. Um, the f- final remark over here is that this geometric genus, which is, um, which is a difficult invariant, can be understood in the Gorenstein case uh, in terms of forms, again by a various, by one of the various versions of duality. So by duality, um, um, PG, uh, in the Gorenstein case, this is the Gorenstein case, is equal to uh, the dimension, complex dimension, of um, the space of uh, well, it's um, I'll just say R times omega modulo the um, the forms that are holomorphic on V twiddle. Okay, so this means all the multiples of this form are, are the local rank. And you might add by the forms that are whole, uh, that are holomorphic on the resolution. I mean, omega has poles. But if you multiply by a function that uh, vanishes on those guys, you can make them holomorphic. When you mod out by them, uh, you compute the length or the dimension. That's the geometric genus. So you can um, twist this further in the Gorenstein case and find uh, some condition on the geometric genus that doesn't require you to go to the resolution. That's kind of what's difficult about this um, in general. Uh, Okay, so how does the Gorenstein property tie in with uh, other properties? How about for uh, uh, rational singularities, for instance? Well, so if, uh, so rational plus Gorenstein, let's combine two properties. Uh, that's, that implies rational double point. So it's very restrictive. So all those rational singularities that I mentioned at, at the beginning, none of them are Gorenstein. Okay, ex- except the easiest ones, the rational double points. Um, just to understand this condition, if you have the cone of uh, C comma L, Okay, remember that's the graded ring from the curve and the line bundle of positive degree. Uh, the Gorenstein condition is that, um, that the canonical line bundle of C is the sum tensored power of L, sum, uh, sum K. So that's exactly the Gorenstein condition for a cone. Um, I won't... Um, write it down, I pointed out that there's a numerical condition, a topological condition that must be satisfied in order to have a Gorenstein singularity. And the question might be, uh, is there any other condition? Is there any other condition on a graph to know that there's a Gorenstein singularity of that graph other than this integrality uh, condition? And a recent theorem of Popescu-Pompu says uh, no. That's, that's the only condition. If you have a graph and it satisfies, you can solve these in integers, then there exists a Gorenstein singularity with that graph. Okay, so that's, uh, I wanted to introduce this notion of Gorenstein. So let's now talk about smoothings. Smoothings. So as usual, let's start with a hypersurface. So if we have uh, uh, so if we have a hypersurface f equals zero, um, so our pic- a picture of it looks something like this. But suppose we look at uh, not at f equals zero, but we look at uh, f equals delta.
So uh, here's uh, f equals zero, and uh, over here is uh, f equals delta, and uh, of course we've uh, intersected with a ball because we're lo uh, looking uh, locally. So I want to uh, I want to make a, a definition. Let me see how I want to uh, to do this. Um, so f gives a smoothing. So the function f gives a, a smoothing of this hypersurface V comma zero and uh, what I'll do is I'll just look at F inverse of delta intersect a small ball there I drew you a picture where delta is uh, uh, much smaller than epsilon and I'm going to call this space that I drew M and this is called the Milner fiber. Milner fiber of the smoothing. So uh, th this is a, uh, what is this? This is a manifold now. V had a singularity. This is a four manifold with boundary. M is a four manifold. And the boundary of M is the same sigma. It's got the same sigma as you had before. So uh, sigma, remember, was up here and uh, down here. But topologically, you have the same sigma for f. So uh, what is it? You perturbed the defining equation, and now you have a, a four-manifold. It's a non-singular now. But f equals 0 is contractible. This has homology. So M has homology, the so-called vanishing cycles. So why is vanishing cycle a good name? Well, as delta goes to zero, this circle shrinks. And in the limit, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a singular point. So uh, as delta goes to zero, you lose homology. And you, you uh, acquire a singularity. So, uh, so here's the theorem. So this is Milner. Um, so 1968 is when his famous book uh, came out. And th th he proved it for all hypersurfaces, um, j just for convenience uh, and focus, doing the case of uh, surfaces. So uh, the first statement is, is that M is homotopic to a bouquet of mu two spheres. So a bouquet just means you take all these spheres and you attach them at one point. This means a homotopic. And mu is uh, some number of them. Uh, and B is that mu, which is the Miller number, can be computed from the defining equation as the co-length of the Jacobian ideal. So you uh, divide out the power series, because we want to look uh, locally, by the uh, partial derivatives. This gives you some uh, number, co-length of this ideal, mu, and that's the number of the two spheres. So uh, this gives you a, um, a topological condition. So this is the rank of H2 of M. And uh, we'll notice that uh, this, by the way, implies that M is simply connected. I wanted to point that out. So there's a precise homotopic description of what this Milner fiber uh, looks like. So uh, over here for this very easy singularity, well, of course, the dimensions are wrong, but you can see that the Milner number for this ought to be 1 because there's one cycle there's one cycle, non-trivial cycle here, which vanishes when delta goes to, uh, to zero. So uh, in particular, so this, this mu is, oh, this is, of course, a mu is a positive, uh, unless you had a, unless you had a non-singular point, right? Because if all of these would be a zero to have a true uh, singular point. So there's, uh, there's more to the story over here. Um, let me just mention more more on M. 
So uh, remember, uh, th this is a complex equation. Uh, M is what's called a Stein manifold. So this is a notion in uh, complex analysis that's similar to being uh, an affine variety. Uh, I won't give the uh, fancy uh, definition, but I'll, but I'll point out that that implies it's uh, symplectic as well. Uh, but it's a manifold with boundary. The boundary is a three manifold. Now when you have a symplectic manifold with boundary, you're interested in uh, a structure on the boundary called a contact structure. And uh, so this symplectic manifold uh, has uh, uh, with, uh, with the uh, intrinsic uh, contact structure on the boundary of M, which is uh, sigma. So what's a contact structure? So a contact structure is an extra kind of, structu of uh, structure, a fairly flabby uh, structure on a three manifold and it corresponds to having a family of uh, planes in the uh, uh, of two planes in the tangent bundle so we're talking about the contact structure uh, which come from the zeros of a, uh, a special kind of one form so I'm not sure I want to write down the definition of a contact structure, it's sufficient to say that the, uh, I didn't mention this before, but the a link of the singularity has an intrinsic contact structure and when you uh, have a smoothing, you get a symplectic manifold that is compatible on the boundary with this contact structure. Okay, so, uh, so I, I, I wanted to mention that this was something that happened, so if you like, that uh, I can say that uh, M is a symplectic filling of sigma. That is to say, sigma is a three manifold, here's a four manifold whose boundary is sigma, and this four manifold has a symplectic structure that's compatible with the uh, contact structure that sigma uh, intrinsically has. Um, now for two, um, there's a lot of extra structure floating around on M that we won't uh, mention. Uh, M has a, a mixed Hodge structure. Mixed Hodge structure and a monodromy. There's a monodromy operator. There's a lot of singularity that goes on uh, in this case, but we won't uh, likely have it in the, in the general normal surface singularity, so I don't uh, go into it. And uh, uh, finally, I'll just mention that M, like V twiddle, is a four manifold whose boundary is a sigma. So there's some symmetric intersection pairing that comes from not Poincare duality, because these guys have boundary, but Lefschetz duality. So I'll just say there exists a symmetric a bilinear form on uh, H lower 2 of M, which is, uh, of course, isomorphic to some Z upper mu. And that allows you to uh, write down mu in terms of its uh, Sylvester invariance, mu plus mu naught plus mu minus. We might want to mention that uh, later. There's this extra uh, structure uh, floating around. And this comes purely from topology because M is a four manifold whose boundary is a compact three manifold. I'll just write Lefschetz. It could be degenerate. It could be degenerate. Again, this is not quite uh, the Poincare duality. Okay, so, so what's the relationship of mu to gamma? I mean, we already talked about, um, we already talked about the PG was more than gamma, so there's a formula of uh, Laufer in, the, uh, in this hypersurface case. It says mu is 12 PG plus uh, some invariance from gamma.
So if I have the resolution graph of a singularity, I can figure out some expression over here. And except for them, these two analytic invariants are related uh, in this way. Um, so, so that's the hypersurface case. Hypersurface case has a smoothing with these special properties, this interesting uh, four manifold called the, uh, called the Milner fiber. Um, and uh, we want to be able to talk about smoothings of general normal surface singularities. So let me first uh, start by saying something uh, about what's a deformation, what's a deformation of uh, V comma zero. So definition, a deformation um, of uh, V comma zero is a, uh, I guess a flat map um, F from um, script V comma zero to S comma zero. So flatness is the property that you need uh, to make sure the fibers are varying in some sensible way uh, with plus an isomorphism of the special fiber um, F inverse zero comma zero with V comma zero. So uh, deformation means that over the origin you've got your original singularity and your other fibers are, uh, you've somehow perturbed the defining uh, equation. And uh, smoothing, smoothing for us will be the case um, F from uh, V comma zero into C comma zero where V is three dimensional with an isolated singularity. So this is what a smoothing is. It's a, it's a flat map from an isolated three-dimensional singularity. So uh, now the general fiber, now the general fiber is non-singular. So F inverse of delta is non-singular for uh, uh, delta small, but um, positive. I put epsilon there thinking that we're, we're already working in a neighborhood. So a smoothing, um, that F is like this F, and we can define a Milner fiber. So we can define M, which is uh, F inverse of delta intersect a small ball. And again, uh, M is a compact manifold with boundary equal to sigma. So you need just sort of some basic uh, differential topology to work this out in m much the way that it's uh, worked out uh, in this case. You have to prove things that uh, it's independent of delta and of epsilon and independent of coordinate changes, but this can be done. So this is the basic structure. When you have a smoothing of a singularity, you have a four manifold that fills a sigma. So what can we say about this? Um, well, uh, should I mention the good stuff or the, uh, or the problems first? Let me, let me just mention some problems. Um, some V comma zero have no smoothings. Some V comma zero have no smoothings. In fact, if you take a cone, um, C comma L, if the genus is positive and the degree of L is greater than or equal to, I don't know, 5G plus 5, something like that, it's not smoothable. No smoothings. Maybe we'll eventually say why. And uh, two, uh, some V comma zero, well, in fact, not some, I'll even give an example. A uh, cyclic quotient uh, V sub four one whose resolution graph looks like this, 
has two smooth, it has two uh, uh, non homeomorphic smoothings, uh, uh, Milner fibers. That is to say, different smoothings, essentially different smoothings. Okay? Uh, in one case, the Milner fiber is simply connected. In the other case, fundamental group Z mod 2. I1 of M uh, is that, or Z mod 2. So this was developed by, uh, so Pinkham discovered this example, uh, but doing something different than looking at topology in Milner fibers. So Pinkham discovered this in the early 70s. Those were the days when one was just beginning to understand deformation theory in general, and that uh, the moduli space of deformations of a singularity could have different components. But uh, it was kind of only later when you looked at this and you saw, well, topologically these were, uh, these were different. Um, so, in fact, uh, three, you could have um, pi 1 of m is uh, infinite. That is to say, there exist singularities and smoothings for which uh, pi 1 is, uh, uh, is infinite. So, uh, what is there that's good about smoothings? What's, what's good? Well, first of all, um, while M is not homotopic to a bouquet of two spheres, it is homotopic to a complex of dimension less than or equal to two. M is homotopic to uh, a complex of dimension uh, less than or equal to two. That's a good start. Um, it's, uh, it's Stein. Uh, that just follows from some complex uh, analysis. And again, um, uh, hence, uh, symplectic compatible with the contact structure on the boundary. Compatible with a contact structure um, on a sigma. Again, I just mentioned in passing that all links uh, have a, a natural uh, uh, contact structure. So, so that's, that's good. Um, but it's not the precise, kind of the precise result uh, that the Milner gave. But a, a, a nice theorem uh, due to Groyl and Steinbrink, uh, something I conjectured and proved in some cases, the first Betty number of M is zero. So M is not simply connected but the first Betty number is zero. So that tells you in particular, so the uh, topological Euler characteristic of M is one plus mu, where again mu is the rank of H lower two of M. So that's, uh, that's something uh, good. And uh, maybe we'll, Maybe I'll uh, let, let me just mention something else. Um, mu naught plus mu plus is 2pg. This was true in the hypersurface case, even though I didn't mention it. Um, so uh, this requires work not only of uh, Groyl and Steinbrink, but Loy and Han and myself as well. But anyway, th so th these are some uh, basic uh, good things about uh, Milner fibers of, uh, of smoothings in general. Um, finally, I'll just say uh, Laufer's formula that I mentioned somewhere. Uh, yeah, yeah, mu equals 12 pg. That's all, that remains true in the Gorenstein case. Laufer's formula for mu true in the Gorenstein case. So I think those are the only uh, sort of really general things that I'll, that I'll mention. So we want to uh, examine some cases where there really is uh, a smoothing. So the, the, the first thing we should mention is uh, 
So, uh, what what has a smoothing? What are some examples? Smoothings examples. So, um, first, um, isolated complete intersection singularities. So those are as, uh, almost as good, almost as good as hypersurfaces. So what do you do in that case? So what's the um, you, you look at the deformation given by the defining equations, Cn into Cn minus 2, given by the defining equations. So you, you, you look at this map. The, so here's a, a flat map. This map is flat. The fiber over the origin is the complete intersection singularity, and the general fiber is non-singular. So the general fiber is a non-singular. So take a general curve through the origin here, and you can, you can have a smoothing in this, uh, uh, this way. Uh, you can just write this thing down, and you have a Milner fiber with uh, basically all the same properties, uh, almost all the same properties as Milner had. So this was worked out by Hom. So this is like the hypersurface case. With one a notable exception. So, and that is, there's no nice formula for the Milner number in terms of these guys. No, no nice formula for mu. Here you have the Jacobian ideal. So you have this formula of Laufer's, but if someone writes down two polynomials for you and says, hey, compute the Milner number, there isn't something simple like computing the co-length of the uh, of the Jacobian ideal. So this is, uh, uh, in, in some sense, it's a surprise that you ended up with a, a nice formula uh, over there. And that's because you'll notice that this nice looking ring, this is not a module over the local ring of the singularity. This, this, isn't, uh, this isn't an O module because F isn't zero over here. So, uh, so the, unfortunately, the Milner number is not the length of any module, of any natural module, over the local ring. Uh, so that problem becomes uh, apparent over here. Um, okay, so that one, that one is fine. Milner fiber is uh, simply connected. Uh, so there's another uh, case, and that is a rational surface singularity. So. Let me just mention the theorem. So, so this is uh, Atia, uh, Biscorn, and uh, Michael Artin, I guess. That says, suppose you have a rational singularity, uh, or in fact, let's look at the minimal good resolution of a rational surface singularity. Of rational. Singularity. Then um, there exists a, a smoothing whose Milner fiber is diffeomorphic to V twiddle to the resolution. So, you have your singularity, um, you smooth the equations, you smooth it out this way, and, uh, but we also talked before about resolving a singularity, kind of blowing up, and going up this way, and putting curves in. Um, so those are two extremely different things, but for rational singularities, you can always construct a resolution, uh, a smoothing in this way. So, um, originally, um, 
So this is sort of Atiyah's first, first flop. Um, the, the point is, if you have a family of, if you had a deformation of the rational double points, which was the cases these guys worked on, if you have a deformation of the rational double points, they saw that you could make a base change and simultaneously resolve, which meant that the total space, so if you had a one-parameter smoothing, just uh, F of a rational double point, after a base change, you could find what's called a small resolution. Matia and Brieskorn for rational double points. Um, you can base change and get a uh, get a uh, script V comma zero with a small resolution. A small resolution means a three-dimensional singularity and a resolution with a one-dimensional exceptional set. One-dimensional exceptional set. Usually when you resolve you get divisors. Co-dimension one. So, uh, so how, we, how do you do this in general? What, what's, what's the idea? Um, and notice I said Milner fibers diffeomorphic to V-twiddle because the Milner fiber is a Stein manifold right. and V-twiddle is definitely not. This has all these projective curves in it. But uh, differentially, they're the same. So, um, in particular, the Milner fiber is uh, simply connected. And topologically, you know what it looks like because we know what resolutions of rational singularities look like. So, how does this work? Pardon me? You need rational double point. No, you don't need rational double point. No, there, there always, there always exists a, a smoothing whose Milner fiber is diffeomorphic to be twiddle. Um, no, I mean what Atiyah and Brieskorn had done is they had actually started with a family, and then did simultaneous resolution after base change. Now I'm starting with a rational singularity in general, and I'm saying you can make a family. So what you would do is the following: um, you have your singularity you resolve it, V twiddle. Now this has all these exceptional curves on it. And what you want to do is deform the resolution and make the exceptional curves disappear. So obstruction theory tells you that when you deform this non-singular surface, there's a, a H1 of theta is telling you about first order deformations. There's an obstruction in H1 of the normal bundle. You want to hit an obstruction because you want to make sure that none of the exceptional curves lift when you deform. In fact, you don't want any exceptional cycles to lift. So you deform this out, some script V twiddle, and then you, so now this is a, this is a surface, this is dimension three. You then kind of want to blow this down to something. And when you blow it down to something, then you want to specialize and hope you get V back. You want to specialize and hope you get V back. For rational singularity, you do get V back. Generally, if we take any singularity, resolve it, and then deform the smooth manifold, when we uh, collapse down and specialize, you'll get an, something not normal. So the only way that this can happen, uh, so you get back you get back V from uh, script V only if the geometric genus stays constant in your family. So when you're deforming this resolution, you, you have this H1 of the structure sheaf and you want that to stay the same, then, then uh, there's this commutation with base change. But if PG is zero, that's no problem. In any case, the bottom line is rational singularity smooth. They smooth in this uh, uh, na sort of natural way and you know exactly what the Milner fiber looks like. That's A-smoothing. All right, so that's, that's a, a good example to know about for, uh, 
for uh, smoothings. Um, but let's mention a, uh, another way in which you can do uh, smoothings that's, uh, that's uh, different. Uh, quotient smoothings. So here we're going to take a, uh, uh, a known smoothing, like say for a hypersurface, and have a group action and uh, divide out by the group action. So what do we need for quotient smoothing? So let's start out with a smoothing F of V into V, which is a smoothing, uh, sorry, into C comma zero, a smoothing of V. Okay, I mean it could be F mapping C3 into C as, as, as we have over here. That's a good case. Um, now suppose a G is a finite group of uh, automorphisms of the total space of uh, script V comma zero acting, uh, acting freely um, off the origin. Okay, so suppose you have such a thing. And suppose further, assume F is G invariant Assume F is G invariant. Then, okay, so we're going to want to divide out by G. So first of all, uh, we notice that uh, the Milner fiber of F, which is F inverse of zero, uh, which is, uh, sorry, F inverse of delta, G acts on this and it, and it acts freely. G acts freely because G acted freely uh, on V minus the origin. So suppose we divide this whole uh, picture out by G. So we have script V0 into C0 given by F. But now suppose we mod out by G. Script V mod G comma 0. I mean, the map factors this way, because F is G invariant. I'll call this F as well. So what happens on the special fiber? Well, the special fiber here is V comma zero, and the special fiber here is V comma zero mod G. So we have over here V comma zero, mapping to V mod G comma zero. And that's what we have over the special fiber. So how about the general fiber? Well, the general fiber here is M sub F, and the general fiber here is M sub F mod G. So the Milner fibers are uh, M sub F and M sub F mod G, where G acted freely on this four manifold. So uh, bottom line, in this picture, we were able to construct a, Milner, a smoothing of V mod G and the Milner fiber is the free quotient of the Milner fiber of the original Milner fiber by the group G. Okay, so I'll show examples in a moment but one thing we should realize when you have uh, a free covering of a manifold Euler characteristics multiply. So the topological Euler characteristic of M sub F is the order of G times the topological Euler characteristic of M sub F mod G. Okay, but uh, we just said this is um, 1 plus mu sub F and this is the order of G times 1 plus mu sub, um, I'll call, uh, maybe I should call that F bar. Call this F bar. So this is uh, kind of some general picture of a quotient. 
But so now let's look at that in um, one particular uh, interesting case. So here's an example. So uh, let's just uh, look, let f map c3, consider f mapping c3 comma 0 into c comma 0. Let's let be the xz minus y to the p. That's an a p minus 1 uh, singularity. So uh, this is a smoothing of this singularity. That's a rational double point. I mean, we know, we know exactly what the Milner fiber looks like. It's simply connected, you know, Dinkin diagram, etc. But now let's look at the group G, which is uh, generated by the matrix zeta, zeta to the um, R, zeta inverse. So let's look at this group. Oh, uh, zeta, zeta to the p is 1. So here's this uh, cyclic group of order p, and it acts on c3. Okay, so I want r to be prime to p. 0 less than r less than p. So uh, g, is, uh, g is free. The action of g is free off the origin. You can see that because r is prime to p. But now, uh, the main point is that xz minus y to the p is invariant. Is g invariant. So the uh, conclusion is that uh, so um, I'll call the, the, the singularity, I'll call that one v. So uh, v, v my g comma 0 has uh, Milner fiber. Um, I'll call it, I don't know, v sub f, uh, m sub f my g. So let's look at this. Uh, formula over here. 1 plus mu f 1 plus mu f equals the order of g times 1 plus mu sub f bar. So the order of g is a p and we know the Milner number of this. It's mu is equal to p minus 1 because you divide out by the partial derivatives. So uh, this over here is 1 plus p minus 1. So the net result is 1 plus mu sub f bar is 1. So mu sub f bar is 0. That is to say, this Milner fiber has Milner number 0. Mu sub f ma g is a QHD, rational homology disk. Or rational homology ball. We already know the first Betty number 0. And what we've shown is that the Milner number is 0. So let's go back. Well, what, what kind of singularity have we smoothed? Well, we've smoothed this cyclic quotient singularity. That's what uh, uh, V sub f is. V sub f. Um, and we've divided that out by another group of order p. So V sub f ma g. Uh, so there's a cyclic quotient of order p by a cyclic quotient of order p. You work it out. This is v sub p squared pr minus 1. So here's the claim. So uh, basically this guy down here 
is itself a cyclic quotient singularity. So uh, what have we shown? So the theorem is V sub, suppose that zero is less than R less than P, P and R relatively prime, then this cyclic quotient singularity is squared PR minus one. Uh, remember, th- this is a rational singularity. Cyclic quotient singularities are all rational. Okay, all cyclic quotient singularities are rational. We know they have these, these kinds of smoothings, but here's a very different kind. This has a smoothing with um, QHD, Milner fiber. So, in other words, if you like, mu equals zero. So, uh, we want to talk about, uh, next time, about the general issue of finding surface singularities with smoothings with Milner number zero. And let me just explain one particular thing that's interesting about them. And for that, look, uh, look here. So what we're doing is we're taking the boundary, this link, in this case, a lens space, which has a contact structure because it's a quotient of the three sphere, it has a natural contact structure. And we're filling it with a symplectic manifold with no rational homology at all. So already from a topological point of view, it is difficult to know if we have a three manifold, is this the boundary of a topological four manifold with no rational homology? From a purely topological point of view, that's a difficult question. So let me just uh, write that down. Um, Here's the problem. Which, let's just say lens spaces, L and Q, are uh, boundaries of four manifolds with no rational homology. Rational homology balls or rational homology disks. So, uh, in 1980, uh, Kasten and Hare wrote a paper and uh, listed a bunch of examples. Listed a bunch of integers n and q. It's not hard to see that n has to be a perfect square, for instance. And uh, th- this had nothing to do with singularities. This is topological construction using Kirby calculus, I think. And they came up with a list and uh, it was referenced to this list by uh, Walter uh, Neumann that had me uh, starting doing this, although the motiva- my motivation for this was, uh, was something a bit different. I should mention that this problem was recently completely solved by Liska, but it's about uh, f- six years ago. And now what we're doing is something harder. We're finding symplectic fillings. We're finding symplectic fillings with no rational homology. Not many of these are symplectic. And in fact, now there's a complete answer in the symplectic case. In the symplectic case, uh, except for a twist, the above are the only ones. P squared over PR minus one are the only ones. So anyway, I'll, I'll talk about this in, uh, in a few days. So, Next time we'll talk about uh, smoothings with Milner number zero. Why are they, what are they good for? So, some of you already know because you've written papers uh, u- using them. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that in a couple days.